Hey everyone, welcome to my next video. In this one I'm gonna show you how to use the SPI communication peripheral. In the previous video I showed you how to use the I2C peripheral, so it's only fitting to take a look at the other one. So the SPI peripheral is also gonna be shown on the example, and in this case I'm gonna be using a DAC chip or the PCM1792. This is an audio deck that I mentioned in a previous video a while back, and I'm also gonna do a follow-up video on that one as well. But for that IC, I chose to use the SPI peripheral, one of my favorites, and I'm gonna show you today how to use that so we can follow on that video later. From the hardware perspective, the SPI peripheral is much more simple and has a bit of an upsides and downsides as well from I2C. And we're gonna take a look at those right now, but if you're here only for the code and the hard initialization, there will be timestamps in the description below. So let's go. So if you remember from previous video, I used this I2C connection diagram from the analog devices page, which is a lovely diagram, to describe you how it works. This diagram is partially correct because there's multiple masters also possible. That's because the I2C lines are passively pulled up by these pull-up resistors and can be only pulled down by each of the devices in the network. Being the master is the only one that can actively start pulling these lines low and only the slave can acknowledge it when it's been addressed by its own address. Now let's take a look at the SPI. There's also a lovely analog devices page on this that I'm also gonna include in the description down below. And the first thing that we can see from the connection diagram is that, well, there are just only one device and there are two times as many lines. Instead of two, there are four and there are no pull-up resistors or any other pull-up or pull-down resistors. That's for a good reason. The first difference is that SPI peripheral is full duplex instead of half duplex like the I2C which means that the SPI peripheral can send and receive data on the same clock pulse which is great this means that we can send and receive data at the same time increasing the bandwidth and increasing the time savings and that's one way that the SPI can be faster also as you can see there's only one device but that's not true multiple devices can be connected to the same master but that can, there can only be one master. And that's the second reason why the pull-up resistors are missing. These lines are actively driven, which means that the master controls these first three lines and the slave will respond by driving this second line. And these lines are hardly push-pull driven. That's why no pull-up or pull-down resistors are needed. But in order to do that and have multiple SPI slaves connected in parallel to these lines, there has to be some kind of way to disable the slave using the particular line. And in this case we're concerned with the MISO line or the master in slave out. So this is the line that the slave will use to transmit its data back to the master. So how do we do that? Well, by using the first pin. Because all the other pins are self-explanatory. So the MOSI pin is the master out slave in, which is the pin that the master is going to transmit data to the slave and the serial clock data, which is the clock pin. The only one that's left is the chip select pin, or the chip enable, and it's differently named, but as its name suggests, this pin enables the slave device. Because of this arrow or this line above it, it means that it's active low, so the slave is enabled when this line is low. So when the slave is not in use, this line should be high, controlled by the master actively, and only when the master is talking to a particular slave that has this line connected to, this line should go low and this slave now knows that it's being connected with and that it can use its SDO or serial data output wire. So if you go a bit down, skipping a few things for now, we see a diagram for multiple slave devices connected at once. As you can see, all the data lines can be connected that's no problem because the slaves only respond when the master tells them to, like in I2C. But there's a problem because each slave must know when it's talking to it. So now we're using the chip select lines over here and it's one for every IC and only when the chip select line for a particular peripheral slave goes low, the slaves can use the, all these lines, especially the MISO line. 
so these are not connecting to each other so let's say this one and this one are connected at once so if this line goes high and this line goes low it can be a short over this wire and you can destroy something so that's why you have to keep track of the chip select pins and only enabling one at a time for each peripheral that you're talking to if you're using multiple like in these configurations but other than that the parallel configuration is like this so as you can see at the minimal amount of wires is four so the data lines are free and then the chip select for the first slave if you have multiple slaves you have to add multiple chip select lines so unlike x squared c when you only use two lines for how many devices you want here you have to use three plus n where n is the number of devices and n is usually one and more so that's all nice now we know that we actually control the communication between the master and slave by using a physical hardware pin so in the i squared c we had to send an address of the slave that we want to talk to and that was one byte but now we don't need to because we exactly know to which slave we're talking to by controlling the chip select pin and the slave knows it's being talked to and having to respond or anything like that by having its line pulled low so we save up the first byte so let's say this is one of the reasons that this communication protocol can be faster also another one is there is no acknowledges so this can be also known as downside because we don't know if the slave is communicating back or if everything's connected correctly so we're just sending and getting some data back so there's no uh, confirmation from the slave so this is one of the drawbacks but it's also faster because that's one clock pulse we're not wasting if you're really going for speed now let's go to this table over here when using arduino possibly you might have seen spi modes so 0 1 2 and 3 but when using spi manually and configuring things and looking at the data sheet you're mostly going to be seeing these two expressions the cpol and cpha the clock polarity and the clock phase this should uh, indicate how the clock can behave different to i squared c where there's only one way to communicate so only one way to do a start condition acknowledge and the stop condition and the sending data here we have different configurations depending on the clock so this is saying when the data is read and when the data is being uh, read back from the device so let's see on the following examples so the first one is the clock polarity the clock polarity basically indicates what is the state of the clock before reading the data or anything happening so over here we can see where my mouse is the chip select pin is high before transmission as we said before when we pull it low now the device the slave device note it's being reading or writing with the master so now the communication starts in this gap over here between these two green lines the clock polarity is low which means that the clock is low before starting to toggle on and off clock polarity on the other hand is over here at zero which means that the data is being read on the rising edge or in this case this is the first edge over here so the first edge is the one that comes from the clock and this means the rising edge and if you go on to the second one but everything is the same except the clock polarity is one which means the falling edge so the falling edge is in this case the second edge the first one when it's going from idle to high and then back down as it said that the orange dotted line is the sampled data while the blue line is the shifted data if we go to the next one which is the clock polarity one in clock phase zero which means that the clock is always high before the transmission so as you can see over here the clock is high but when the transmission starts it's gonna go low and high alone and high clock polarity again is zero which means that the clock will be sample on the rising edge in this case this is the rising edge over here but if the clock polarity again is one that means that the data will be sampled on the falling edge so in this case this is the third edge over here so the orange one over here so this creates four different scenarios i don't really know why they exist and why they differ from the processor to processor and the peripheral to peripheral 
the processor can deal with all of this and we're gonna see this later in how but the different peripherals i guess need different configurations depending on their hardware build the physical hardware that is inside the ic so this is almost pretty much it for the settings of the spi but for additional settings i'm gonna use the data sheet for the DAC to show you a bit more and this is going to be universal for all SPI. So this is the datasheet for this DAC. And let's go to the SPI section over here. So this is the diagram that you're realistically going to get in a datasheet of the slave device that you will be using. So in this case, this IC uses two bytes of data. So as we can see that there is no address of the device byte over here as with i squared c that's because we're using chip select to manually select which device we are using also what i want to show you this on this diagram that not all data sheets are gonna show you the spi mode like 0 1 2 3 or explicitly tell you the clock polarity and clock phase you have to see this for yourself so let's try to see this from this diagram ourselves so as we can see the master select or the i don't know what they're using to here but this is the chip select obviously because it's the only one that has the dash over here the master clock the master data in and master data out so this is the mosi and this is the miso so as we can see that before addressing anything the data out pin of the device is in high impedance mode which is great because before transmitting data it must not disturb this line if the master is talking to another device because these two pins are also parallel to other devices so this device can also see these pins but cannot influence this one so when the chip select goes low the clock starts ticking over here so what we can see clock is low before anything else so before the communication starts that means that the clock polarity is zero so it's zero before starting the transmission now let's see we're gonna see over here what is the clock polarity so as we can see in more detail when the chip select goes slow the clock starts going high and the data over here this is the data being sent the data is being sent right on this first rising edge over here which means that the clock polarity is zero if it were to be one the clock would be red over here but this is too late the clock as you can see couldn't actually be covered over here so in this case we can see that the clock is being red on the rising edge this can also be seen by this one if you're really close enough so this is a more idealistic point so as we see this is the bit of the data going out so this is the width of this bit being transmitted so if this bit is one it's gonna be wide this much and if this one gonna be low it's gonna be low this much and as you can see the data can only be read on the edge so not over here but on this edge or this edge so in this case this configuration this would be the first and this one would be the second edge and this one would be the clock polarity zero because it's going up and this one would be clock polarity one because it's going down and if we can see where this bit could be sent or read by this device so only edge that gets aligned with this bit is the first one is the rising edge so that confirms its clock polarity zero because the falling edge is right on the border where it usually isn't safe to read or transmit data that's why we can confirm that the data is being read slash sent on the rising clock edge i hope this makes sense uh, this analogy if you don't understand just rewind back it will click just like that also we can see that the receiving data going here can come as well on the rising edge now to visualize this you have to again another one parameter you have to know it in which order the data is being set it is the first bit going or the last bit in a number for that we're also gonna be using this diagram over here we can see the data structure that this device can expect so in total 16 bits maximum the first one over here is the register index so this would be in i square c terms the second byte being set so letting know the peripheral from which address we want to read or write to 
And the next one, in the write sense, is the data that we want to write into the register that we have addressed before, or the data that we're gonna be receiving. But for that we have a separate line over here. So in this case, let's say we send the address of the register we want to send the data to, and then we just send again the data. If we're reading from this register, we're sending again the data or the address of the register, and the data will come back by this line. But how do we know which data gets sent first, the most significant, which is over here, or the least significant, which is here, or if you see this as a whole, it's over here. Well, you can see over here that the first clock pulse, the read-write, or the most significant bit gets sent. So this data is going this way, but if you visualize it, which bit gets sent first, you fix this line and you move the clock line left. So uh, imagine you're moving this clock pulse, the, this clock train pulse to the left and uh, see from which bit it's being pulsed. And the data line being sent back is also the same. It's, uh, it's like an arrow, it's pointed this way. So the least significant bit is over here and the most significant bit is over here. So the most significant bit is the first one being sent because this clock pulse happens before this one. So that's why this gets sent before this one. So we can see that in this case, and in my experience with most SPI peripherals, the order is most significant bit first. Rarely there's a least significant, but that's one setting that we're gonna have to look in the future. So now we covered how you can use the data sheet to know exactly the clock polarity, the clock phase, and the bit sending and receiving order without having any explicit say, uh, said in the datasheet. And I believe that there, I read this over and over and there is no explicit declaration of the clock polarity and here's everything. No clock polarity, no clock uh, uh, phase and no bit order mentioned. So that's why you need to also know how to read these graphs. So now let's finally go to the workspace and show you how you have to do the hard initialization with the information that we learned now. So as usual, I have a bare bones STM32 F407 discovery board on my bench right now. It's connected to the deck IC and the deck IC is now on standby also connected to my computer. So the music will be able to hear from the speakers. In terms of a project, this is universal for everyone, so the only thing that is initialized is the input clock and the debug lines over here. So we're starting from scratch, nothing pre-built, so if the project maker asks you if you want to initialize the peripherals by default, just click no and reset uh, or the clear pinout. In order to initiate the SPI, you have to know which pins can support the SPI. So you can go to the datasheet and the reference menu for that, but now we're so deep in HAL, we can use it very easily. That's why we can go to the connectivity, click on the SPI1, in this case, let's just use the first one, and let's expand this one. And this is much easier way of just going individually from pin to pin and seeing which one supports the SPI, doing this on purpose. So let's go over here and enable full duplex master. So transmitting and receiving at the same time again. And enabling that, as we can see, it has also configured the GPIO for these pins because they're green. So the peripheral and the GPIO has been initialized. So these are the SPI pins. So the clock, MISO, MOSI. Great. But where is the chip select? Well, chip select can be configured over here as the hardware NSS output. But usually I leave it on disable and configure that one by myself and control it by myself. So let's say these are PA5, 6 and 7. Let's use PA4, which is the closest one. It's going to be an output. And let's go to the GPI configuration and let's force it on high at the beginning. So the pin when initialized is gonna be automatically high because we don't want the slate device doing anything with these pins. Also let's give it the name so it can be accessed easily. So like the SPI peripheral has named these pins, let's go with the same like SPI1 chip select. 
like this. And the maximum output state, let's go very high because these pins are also configured very high just for the sake of it. Now let's go back to the SPI. We of course have a few settings. The first is the frame format, which is default by Motorola. That's because this is the company that invented the SPI peripheral. Then is the data size. Usually, like in I2C, it's always 8 bits or 1 byte, but in this case it can be 16. So it's gonna leave it just at 8. Next is the first bit over here. So which bit is the first being said? And as we said before, it's usually MSB first, or most significant bit first, rarely least significant, but you can toggle this at your wish. The next are the clock parameters. We know the clock polarity about and the clock phase, but we haven't talked about the frequency, the baud rate. So baud rate just means how many bits per second are being sent. And you can translate into the hertz as well. So this is 35 megabits per second and one bit is sent by one clock period. So this means 35 megahertz. Now, not all peripherals can operate that fast, so you have to look again in the datasheet for the speed of the peripheral. So let's go back to this timing diagram, which this is, so we can know what is the frequency. Again, no explicit data, but if we know the period of the clock pulse, then we know how fast the data can be sent. So this is this information, MCY. So this is the period, because it goes from the beginning to another beginning of another pulse. So this is the one clock cycle over here. So let's see what is this period. So TMCY is the pulse cycle time, the minimum of 100 nanoseconds. So to transform this into the Hertz, you have to do one by divided by 100 nanoseconds, which comes out at 10. So let's calculate it. So the frequency one is one divided by the period. In this case, it's 100 nanoseconds, so 0, 0.000, so now we're in micro, so 0, or this one is 1, so this one, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, so micro, and this is nano, and this equals to 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, so 10 megahertz, so this is 10 times 10 to the power of 6, so we know that the maximum operation of this one is 10 megahertz, but there's a beautiful thing about the SPI, and in this case, let's say this peripheral can, uh, this uh, particular peripheral can handle 10 megahertz. But let's say we have a parallel IC on the data line that can only handle 1 megahertz. And these two devices are in parallel. And let's say we don't want to change the frequency before transmitting to each data. So we can leave those settings again. The beautiful thing is that the clock can be changed by the master. Because SPI is very simple peripheral and it's really based around the shift register and those shift register on the input side, so the master side and the slave side can only run as fast as the clock is running. So this slave device will respond only when the clock is ticking. So if the clock stops, the slave is gonna stop sending and if the clocks resume, the slave is gonna resume sending which also means that the different speed of the clock is just gonna determine the speed of the data going in and out. So basically, in a nutshell, the clock speed going down is unlimited. It's only limited by going up. So there's only the upper limit of the clock speed. So you can choose a lower clock that your IC can do. So in this case, 10 megahertz, but it can also be lower than that to accommodate any other peripherals on the same uh, data lines. So in this case, the 35 megahertz is also too fast for this peripheral. So we have to change this prescaler. So this is just another clock divider before going into the SPI peripheral. So let's just lower this one. By 4, this is still not enough. And by 8, is just enough. So we're going to use this one. So this is the, the frequency that we just uh, done. Next is the clock polarity and the clock phase. Now we know the clock polarity and phase are or zero, or the first edge and the, the first positive edge and the zero is the initial clock polarity. So in this case, we're gonna use low and the first edge as it's called in this particular instance. So this is the first edge that is gonna happen. Also, we're gonna leave this to default. Again, the 
NSS or the peripheral selection is going to be done by software, so we're going to manually trigger this pin. Great, let's save it and let's go into the main and see what the function you're going to be using. So I'm going to write this function in the main right now. Here are all the functions that you should be using for normal polling operations, so no interrupts and DMA. And let's go over them. So the first one is the transmit function. And this one, as it is suggest, it will transmit data. As always, the first parameter is the handler to the SPI peripheral. It's all already initialized. And then it's pointer to the data we want to send, size of the data we want to send, and of course the timeout at the end. So this is basically doing this part. So it's gonna send how much of data you want to send, how, how many bytes of data we want to send, and what is the data that we want to send. So the receiving part is doing exactly the same. Again, how, man, how much data we're gonna receive and where to dump the data to. Again, a pointer to that variable. There's an interesting one called transmit receive. And that is done because, again, the SPI is full duplex, which means we can transmit and receive at the same time. And in this case, the size has to be the same, as we can see over here. This whole window is 16 bits wide, you could call it like that, but only the first uh, or the second transmitted 16 bits by the slaves are useful. So the first, these bits over here are gonna be I don't know, high or low or some garbage because this device is gonna have a high impedance mode. So this data over here is useless. So this is the first data that's gonna be received by the microcontroller. And this is the second data, which is the actual data coming from the receiver. Again, this is the data going from the master to the slave in this order. So if we want to receive data, we can either tell it, hey, I want to get the data from this register and send the address of the register over here and then call the receive function and receive data and we're gonna get this byte over here because the clock is gonna be on halfway. But if you want to do it in a one neat function, the transmit receive function is here. So all you need to do is give it the pointer to the transmit and the receive data and the size, which is uniform for the both of them, because the pulse is gonna be as the longest one. So you have to know which data you have to discard. So this is the function that you're gonna use. But again, now there's one thing that I left off for the last part, and it's similar, actually it's the same as for I2C. Most devices have at least multiple registers, or even if they have one, you still have to address it some way. If they only have one, you usually see sending the dummy data, so-called, which is either zero or just one. So the first data is just zero or one. While the data, if we have multiple registers, uh, as in this case, we have different registers, so they are described by these bits over here, have to be addressed. So that's why the data sheet's for. So if we go to the register of these modules, you can see that there are registers from register number 16, to the register number 23 and we can see the table of all these registers over here and their value so the register 16 has a value of 16 but these are the only first seven bits of the address byte the first one is the read write so if we want to read from this register this whole byte has to be sent with having the first the most significant bit as one but if we have it as low then the device will think that we are going to write into this register. So it's very similar to I2C, where, but in I2C, this read-write bit was the least significant one in the address byte. So all the address of the uh, peripheral that we want to talk to was the first seven bits, and the eighth bit or the least significant bit was the read-write. Also, the read-write functionality was a part of the address of the device, not the uh, peripheral address. So in this case, the address of the registers inside the peripheral. So this is one difference. So now we're sending the read-write command with the address of the peripheral that we want to access to, 
either write or read, whereas with accuracy we use the read-write bit as the least significant bit in the address of the actual device, and the address of the register that we wanted to talk to device was just normal address without the read-write one. So this is the difference, but it had to be applied somewhere, because we don't have address of the device, we have the address of the register of the device, so that's where the read-write bit is hidden. So this is also a thing that we have to make sure we get right when reading and writing to the device. So, to give you an example, I have a few functions already written over here for this IC, and I'm just gonna copy them in the IDE, and let's talk about them. Okay, so before we go into the while loop, I have a few variables con configured as before. We have one for the data coming in, because we know that these registers from this device are only 8 bits wide, we can expect only 8 bits in return. So we have one 8-bit variable for input data, output data, and the address of the register we want to talk to. In this case I chose the register 18. The data on the output in this case is going to be configuration for this register. This configuration for this register, in this case for the register 18, is exactly the same, just the mute bit is being changed. So we're going to flip this mute bit in the next section by adding another command so we can experience to see if the device is working as it should so the device should be muting its output so other than that this value is the default value that is gonna be in this register from the startup so in order to see what is going on let's first read that register so we're having a function so I defined a few functions so the reading and writing function which accept the register we want to read or write to, in this case read, and then the pointer to the variable where the data being read to is being returned. So in this case it's the address of the data in variable. If we want to write and change the appropriate uh, configuration register, we put in again the address of the register, which in this case 18, and then again the pointer to the data where the configuration data is stored, in this case it's the pointer to the data out. Now let's see what these functions do and let's go firstly to the right one, which is the simplest. So here's the configuration for the right function. It's very short because HAL again does a lot of us, but in the case of SPI provision there aren't really that much to do. So the first thing, this function is of HAL status type def, so it will return any sorts of errors committed by this function. As because we have HAL, we can utilize these errors, either something in peripheral timed out, or there was an error inside the peripheral, but other than that, there is no error correction, there is no uh, seeing if anything is out there, uh, if the slave device got any data, like the acknowledge pin in the I2C. So there aren't any kind of errors for that part, but we do have some overflow errors and uh, other transmit errors that can occur. Also the transmit function over here is gonna take care of all the checking of the flags. So the output uh, register that is gonna be pushed the data to the receiving parties, in this case our peripheral DAC, you have, before you write into this register, you have to make sure it's empty, so the data isn't overflowing. So it's just not overwritten, it's just garbage going out. So all this halting is already done by the transmit function by HAL. And this is a neat thing. If you go back to the videos on the standard peripheral library, the HAL, the SPAT transmit function over there only just took the data and put it in the transmit register of the STM32. So we have to manually check if the transmit register was empty or not before doing so. So this is where HAL is a little bit useful because it spares you uh, checking over and over, but it's good to know that that is a possibility. Now let's go to the configuration, what we have over here. So we know that we want to write into the register. We firstly, let's go back up to the SPI. We have to write the address of the register we want to write in this case. So the first bit over here is zero because we want to write, then is the address, and then we send the data that we want to put into that address register. So in order to do that, I put together a whole uh, 8-bit array 
which consists of the first bit which is the address and then it's the value of the pointer to the data that we want to send. So the first bit is the address and the second one is the data that we want to write it. That just spares us having to call this transmit function twice. But here let's separate it a little bit. The first thing we do is toggle the chip select pin low. So this is how we start the communication. So firstly we have to pull this pin low and basically almost instantly we can start the transmission of this line. So we send the send data array, it's two bytes big. So we send the register address and then the data going to the register. We give it let's say 20 milliseconds which is overkill but let's just for the sake of testing. Give it the timeout. Now if anything should go wrong with the SPI peripheral and uh, there were any overruns or some type of error, this function is gonna exit and return this appropriate error if you want to do anything with it. If everything's fine, it's gonna continue and write this pin high. Also, I found error over here. Should any error happen, firstly, we should also pull this pin one again. So if anything happens wrong, we just close the communication and then we return. Because if this line wasn't over here, then we would return and this pin would always be low so the device would be using the uh, uh, MISO pin. So if you later wanted to talk to other devices that pin would be always low so the device would not be responding correctly. So this is one way so always remember to uh, pull the pin high again before closing the communication. But if everything is okay, this if statement was not executed, again we have to pull the pin high and return the HAL OK. We could also put this line over here and spare it. So after the transmit we could put it over here and this is probably the preferred way I would do it. So over here we do all the SPI communication and then we just check for the errors of the transmit function and if there was an error we exit and if it's not we return the HAL OK. So this is the write function. Let's go up to the receive function which is a little bit longer and we also have to address this problem of uh, pulling the pin back high. So one of the ways is that you send first the address of which register you want to read from, like in this example. So we transmit the address of the register and then we use the receive function to receive one byte of data. And also, in this case, this function should also be called before exiting if any error should happen. So we close the communication. So firstly, we start the communication, we transmit the data if there was any errors, we close the communication and then exit the function, again on the receiving part. The next thing we can do is use the transmit receive function. For that, we, uh, let's comment this, use this for the beginning and then this one, for the so you can see that everything still works. So in this case, this function also, if everything should happen, so every, any error should happen, we should firstly close the communication protocol. And again, the first parameter is send data, then is the received data, then the size of the data being sent and received, and the timeout. And for that, I created two arrays over here. So the send data is comprised of the address data and then the dummy data because we have to send it something because it has to last some time. So, so let's say it's zero. So firstly we send the address, but then we'll order the expecting data back. So this data over here should be dummy, something meaningless. So in this case, I put in zero. So this is the dummy data that is usually referred to when reading some kind of Arduino tutorials. The received data is two byte size because the two bytes are gonna be received because we're sending two bytes because we have to, because only the second byte of the receiving is the actual data. Again, so this is the first byte being sent, but this is the second byte being received. That's why we need to read and send two bytes. So that's why we create an empty receive data array. So that's why in this function, I just uncomment it so we can see it a little bit better. We 
parsing the uh, the pointer to the send data and receive data registers they are two bytes wide and we will see that only the second byte on the receive data is actually meaningful but now let's firstly test this first part of this function so this is the old way and let's see how this functions so in essence it's gonna read the configuration of this deck then it's gonna write new configuration in this case it's gonna be just a stock one and then we're gonna read what we changed right now in order to have some change let's change this stock one a little bit so i'm gonna do an or operation on the first bit if you remember i told you before then that the first bit of this one is the mute bit so we're gonna activate and deactivate the mute bit of this configuration register so by playing some relatively free music provided by youtube i'm gonna be able to hear and you're probably gonna be able to hear if the speakers are going in and out with a pulse of let's say half a second so this should be the interval so let's compile to see if everything is okay the warnings we have some uh, wasted variables we're gonna use them when we test this function so for testing purposes let's put a breakpoint over here and breakpoint when we finish after the so it's gonna pull the line up before we stop the processor let's see if we have any breakpoints here no so let's start our debugger again i have a jlink so it's a bit different for me but all the configurations were explained in the previous videos so let's click f8 so let's go to this function so now let me just enable some music arduino so this is library and let's pull it high let me enable this stream edec okay Oh, it's probably already on mute. Okay, so let's go to this line. So now we have read the data. As we can see, the data is Q81. So this is the new shifted data. Okay, so now we've read the data that is in the uh, DAC chip right now. So in this case, the DAC chip is actually on mute because this first bit is on one. So that's why you can't hear any music. Now, let's go again into the re uh, read function but we're gonna pass the write function now if we read again the read register the data should be q because this data again has been sent so the mute has been applied again now you can hear the music that's because we have surpassed the circle we had toggled the first bit again and now if we read again the new configuration we can see the first bit is zero so the mute is disabled so now let's stop these two and let's go to the main function and put the breakpoint over here and let's toggle it so we have the first bit on mute we read the configuration configuration is still unmuted now we write that configuration and as you can hear it's silence so we have written this new data in so the data out now should be uh, 81 so 81 is the data input so we've read from the ic so now we can confirm that the ic is on mute now if we go back again we toggle the first bit so the data that's going out should be unmuted now we read again from the ic we confirm that it's on mute now we write and the music should start playing excellent and we read and we can see that the new configuration is unmuted and again so we mute it so if i run this function without any breakpoints by using this symbol over here to skip all breakpoints on a period of half a second it's gonna enable and disable the mute of the ic as you can hear great so now let's re-enable them and it's on mute great so by the way i was using the i feel like parting right now from uh, youtube audio library so this is a practical example of how this works now i promised you i'm gonna also show you how to use the second part so this is the 
as by transmit and receive, which in my opinion is more more elegant way of using than this one by just gluing together two different functions. Let's just use this one, which is just made for this. But in this case it's reading, so it's not doing any harm, so we're gonna manually see what it's reading over here. So let's uh, put a breakpoint over here and a breakpoint over here again. So we're gonna stop at the beginning and at the end. So I'm just gonna put on the mute and re re-upload and recompile. And let's run. And let's run into the function. Let's have a breakpoint over here as well. So I'm over here. If I unmute it, no music is playing. But then, oh, so it's not playing because it's finished. Okay. It should be playing right now. So now if we read and we go into the receive data, we can see that device is on mute only on the second byte. The first byte is garbage because this is the first byte that device was the when our master was sending data. So this is this byte. This is the address byte along with in this case the first bit is one because we are reading from the peripheral and the second is zero. This is this dummy data over here. And we're reading data and the first data that's being read is just garbage because the data is high impedance but the second byte is the actual byte that we care. So this is the byte that we uh, got back from the device once it received this first byte of the where address it wants to communicate. Now if we just let it go it's gonna do its function again. So as you can see that uh, this function works exactly like the combination of these two. So this is the one that I will use, but for the examples that I'm going to provide you with in the GitHub repository, I'm also going to have these two. So these are going to be two versions and you will be able to choose either one of these two. But if this is here for you to use, why not use it? If you're just reading, then just use the reading data. If the let's say slave device is just talking, but in order to talk it would have to be firstly addressed by master, so why not use the transmit receive function anyway. So I hope this was a nice explanation how everything works again on a practical example. So we actually got to look at an actual data sheet and how some manufacturers can, in this case Texas Instruments, can write the data sheet around a common interface like SPI. So I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.